Hi, this is Enrico from Jaranga. In this video, we're gonna look at the graphic user interface as a short introduction. There will be more videos coming up for more details about the sections and how to, to do certain things in the software. So right now we just do a rough introduction on the graphic user interface here running on a software called OOPA as an oval programming environment. Uh, once you start the robot or if you are running on a virtual machine, um, the software will start automatically and welcome you with a login screen. Um, for the shipping password for the accounts admin and um, operator, which are the two default accounts on the system, um, the password is the number one. So we key in one and log in. Then the first um, screen coming up is um, the setup for the configuration for the tool center point and the center of gravity. So what that means is if there is anything mounted to the robot end defector, like a gripper or, or anything similar, we need to let the system know the um, kinematics, which means the tool center point, so we know around which point we want to rotate. If we don't key anything in like flange center, we can see here it will be on the zero, zero, zero position. Um, and if we add any payload to the system, we need to tell the safety system and the collision um, check in the background what kind of payload we added. So we see the payload here on the bottom in kilogram. If nothing is mounted to the, the oboe, it will be flange center with both zero, which is fine. Um, if you have a standard on unpack the oboe, there will be um, no tools on it yet, unless you get it from, from us and you ask for some to be predefined and pre-configured. So if you have tools like I have a setup here in this version, like a 2F85, which is a robotic gripper, or VG10 and VGP20 from OnRobot, then you can select these. Um, if you have a tool just mounted to the robot, if you plan to mount it, um, you shouldn't shouldn't install it first. You should first set up the tool in the software. For that, you have to go through the flange center and startup, and then come back and restart the software after you, you mounted it. Okay, we go for the flange center right now. Um, yeah, so save that one and then start up. Um, if everything works well, you should run through the initialization. The robot is going to turn on, the brakes going to release, and then the software interface is going to start. Okay, here don't mind this message. This is because I have um, a Modbus device configured which the robot is communicating with. Um, it is not in a standard version, so um, you will not see that pop up. Let's go at the look at the standard screen. Normally you would end up with robot teaching. So what do we see here? So number one, what we see is on the top bar, we see what user is logged in right now. Then on the left side is just the logo. On the right side, we have a user logout. So you can go back to the system and come back to the login screen. Or you have a shutdown system, which is gonna shut down the complete robot. Then we have a tabs here on top. Um, let's go back to the uh, about tab for now. Here under version, uh, you need to have a look which version on the teach pendant you're running right now. So the latest um, at the moment where we do the video is the version 4.5.35. The foreign version and the Chinese versions are different. And um, this may be a reason if you see something different or something behaves different when you see it in the screen right now, um, you might have an older version or maybe it depends how old this video is already a newer version. Let's go to the robot teaching. Here we have different sections. Um, we have uh, real-time data from the, from the join. To be honest, um, there is not a lot of uh, situations where the normal user is going to use that. Then we have the option to set up the work mode. The work mode is the difference between the real robot, which means when you press on any of the orange arrows, the actual robot is going to move. If you go on simulation robot, which I'm doing right now, you see the 3D interface for the, for the robot. The actual robot, which is connected right now and powered on, will not move if we are on simulation robot. So this one is very important. Then we can move a robot around if we want to have a look in the 3D version. And we see two coordinate systems we are using right now. There is a coordinate system here, the arrows in the corner, which is actually configured in the base. So we have red for the X direction, green for the Y direction, blue for the Z direction. And we have a second co coordinate system, which is 
on top of a robot tool here, which has also the three arrows with the same, same directions. So red is X, green is Y, and blue is Z direction, and the rotations around. So when we are looking at these coordinate systems, we have the arrows here on the right, which follow the base coordinate system at the moment, which means in the robot base. It is possible to follow um, other coordinate systems for the movement. I'm not going to go too much into detail right now on um, how to use the coordinate systems. We will make a separate video for that. Um, you should, in a standard robot, you should be fine with a base coordinate system where you see here when you press on the Z button, you can uh, jog the robot down and the Z plus you can up. Yeah, remember we are using the coordinate system in the corner here, the blue one, so um, Z positive is going up. And then we have a direction in X minus, X plus, and Y and Y. Okay. If you want to rotate the tool in any of the angles, we have the orientation control here on the bottom. This orientation control is following what target we are setting here on the left side. So if we use the flange center, you can see the coordinate system on the tip of a robot. If you use another tool, we will actually rotate around that tool in this mode. So that's the only real difference for you to use here. So let's let's check something. If we do a rotation around the point, is it possible? Are we rotate in Z direction, in Y direction? You see that it actually rotates around the point we are seeing in there right now. Okay, rotating back. If we use a different tool, like the 2F85 gripper, which is a quite, actually it's a 2F140 for this configuration, which has quite a distance, and we are rotating around it, the robot is rotating it around a different different point in space. Yeah. So if you do any setups, we highly recommend to do that. If you want to dock the tool based on the perspective, you can change the reference coordinate system as well. Okay, this is just very, very uh, raw. We will m do more details later on that one. When we have on the, the last one we have on the right side is the joint control. So here you can control every individual joint, um, starting joint one until six. Joint one is the base joint down here. Then we have joint two is the shoulder one. Then we have three is the um, elbow one. And then we have three wrist joints, one, two, and three, the last one on top. So you can control these directly by rotation. This right now is a fixed uh, jog distance in the software. If you need more fine adjustments, like when you pick up a part, you can change the robot to a step mode and you can actually configure how, how much it's actually traveling in which direction, which makes sense when you do like some fine positioning setup um, with a robot for pickup or place positions. Okay, we don't need that one right now. Then just to be complete, um, on the bottom we have a zero pose and the init pose. Um, Frankly, you don't really use that a lot. Um, I haven't seen any particular implementation where it makes most sense um, to do that. If we go for the init pose, you can see this is a pre-configured pose there. Um, the zero pose is a robot being fully straight up um, with all the joints in a, in a standard position. So it doesn't really make a, make a big difference there. I'm sure there will be some application where it makes sense to have an init pose in the way you need. However, when you start a robot program, it will always use the first waypoint in the program, so um, you don't need it for the actual program execution. Then we have a little other section here, the decimal number. This is your TCP speed, so when you're moving a robot, it's your um, current tool center point speed. Let me just set this one back to a flange center here. And we have uh, level six, which is a collision class. So there's collision classes from one to 10, with 10 being the most sensitive and one being the least sensitive one. So level six is the standard configuration. Then the date and time, and then the speed, we are actually um, jogging or moving the robot around with all these arrows or with a joint um, part directly. So this is the main, main interface, which you also use then for um, adjusting waypoints in the program. Then we have a section programming. So here right now I already have a project open. Let's close this for, let's do a new one for this case. Uh, no, I don't need to save that one. So um, here you can have projects, which is your main um, execution uh, part. So you program it here and then you can see it when it's running. Here on the right side, we have at the moment conditions, 
which you can add to this project like loops, uh, moves, um, set signals and so on. We have procedures. Procedures essentially is like a, a program template you can make. You can include it in the project, but um, it will not change the original file. It will actually create a copy and you can modify this copy in the project um, uh, program here. So um, it works very nice as a, as a template feature. Then we have the conditions which we just saw, which have basic conditions. Then we have some advanced conditions like thread and scripts or including procedures. And then we have peripheral, which is additional devices, which right now represents here a two finger gripper from robotic. However, there will be more coming in the future in the section where you can control additional devices, which are connected with a, with a robot. Then we have, let's go on the condition basic for a moment. We have a control here on the bottom. When we are executing the program, the move limit is actually the speed and percentage. So once you made a program, it's recommended that you use the slider to a lower percentage, like 10, 20% test your program in the simulation first when uh, tested in the real world and confirm make sure that it behaves the way you expect it we have the arrows forward and backwards so which is mean um, go back one step um, if you accidentally deleted something you can reverse or you can go back forward um, then you have the cutting we have a copy and then we have a paste and then we have a delete the paste only works when you copied something and either at an empty spot or at um, a condition of the same type. Yeah, like you can only do a set command on a set command or a wait on a wait or a set on an empty or a wait on an empty. So there's something important. Sometimes people wonder why they couldn't, couldn't paste um, what we copied before. Then we have the config sections. Here we can configure on one side global variables, which is the first um, tab here. Uh, we have different types like bool, integer, double and post. We will make some, some extra session about these as well. Then we have the option to record tracks. Basically you can move the robot by hand and it will record in the background with movement and when you can use it in your program. Then we have an area state. In state we have a variable state. So this is useful when you want to watch the variables while your program is running. You have timers. You can, when you inserted a timer into a program, you can actually see between independent loops or between two timers how long something took. It's very helpful if you try to optimize your um, cycle times. Then we have a simulator. So you can run your program fully in the simulation mode. You can see here on the right, we can still move a robot around if you want to see different stuff. And <clears throat> it's very helpful to test um, the actual execution of a program um, if you don't want to run the real robot. Then at the bottom we have a script editor, so it's possible to do some, some high level um, programming or let's say a highly advanced programming but on a low level side um, of a software. We will have tutorials for that as well, how to use that. Next step on top is the settings. The settings we start on the top with the I.O. state. <clears throat> Sorry, the I.O. state, we have a controller I.O. as a first one. The controller I.O. is the physical I.O.s which are on the control box. Yeah, so we have um, safety I.O.s which are here marked as SI, 0, 0 and 10. What means safety I.O.s generally ha have to be a redundant system. So you need to have two lines if one of them interrupts. Um, that the system is triggered. Um, here we have an emergency stop, for example, which is bridged at the moment. And we also have, uh, I believe, a safety guard stop, which is also bridged at the moment. The rest, um, you can see in the manual, or we will have another video, what, what exactly is what. Then on the, on the bottom below, we have the safety outputs um, for the system, also in double pairs. Then we have internal IOs, which is only used for debugging. It's not accessed by, by you as a normal user or programmer. And then we have linkage IO. Linkage IOs, they actually allow you to run a robot completely without a teach pendant or do a remote control via PLC. We will have a separate session for these ones as well. Then the ones you use uh, most likely is the user IOs. We have a top section, digital inputs. 
Yeah, so here you can see if you connected the sensor, for example, to the digital input zero, you could see if it's green, whether it's on or gray when it's not on. The F1 until F6, F1 until F5, these inputs are not used right now. F6 is used in linkage mode for clearing error messages um, and error states. So here you have your um, 16 digital inputs. Um, what is important to know here is they are NPN system, which means when you are connecting zero wall to them, you get a high signal. Yeah, so this is important to understand the difference between NPN and PNP systems. Then we have DO, digital outputs, where we have another 16 of them. Then we have analog inputs and we have analog outputs. I'm uh, one on one side with current control and on the other side with a voltage control. Uh, here on the bottom, you can set the value for the analog outputs, for example, if you like, um, for the control. Then one more important thing is the tool I.O. So at the, at the tip of a robot, we go back to the screen here, we see this little, little gray um, button there, which is an actually a, a black a cap on top. This is the tool I.O. connector. So let's go back to the tool IOs. Here we have the power control for the tool IO. So by default, there is no power on this tool connector to prevent any short circuits or any other issues when something is not connected. Um, if you want to use it, you will have to choose whether you want to use a 12 volt or a 24 volt system. And once you made a change, you have to confirm it with an admin password. Then we have four um, digital inputs or outputs. So the beauty here in this system is you can control actually which one you want to be a digital input and which one a digital output, which gives you a lot of freedom. In many other systems I have seen, you have to have either it's defined already as an input or an output. And here you can have up to four inputs or four, uh, four outputs, or you can uh, mix them in between. Then here on the right side, we see the on button because we have two um, signals uh, controlled as outputs, so we can actually manually turn them on and off if we like. The only other thing important here on the bottom is the pin configuration 86. This is the analog inputs, so we have two more analog inputs on the tool connector as well for getting sensor signals in. If you, there is a custom cable um, with an open end as part of a, a robot shipment. If you want to make your own tool, let's say you add like, some sensors or you want to trigger some electrical grippers, here is the um, wire um, coding. So you have the signals uh, and uh, with, uh, on the left, you have the colors in there and you have a pin numbers on the right in case you, you use a different cable. Careful here. Um, the pins are not in order. You see here one, two, five, seven, three, and so on. So you really have to keep an eye on which pin number is which color if you use not the OBO um, provided cable. Then we have a robot settings. Robot settings here is what we saw earlier, the fixed pose. So we have an init pose we can configure here. We can uh, configure the package pose. So this is basically the one uh, you use for packing the robot back in a box if you want, so you don't have to start a program or anything like that. You just can go to this um, screen in the settings and press on the, on the package pose and tell the robot to move there and then the robot is going to move into the package posi position. Um, you can change these poses if you have to, however, normally there shouldn't be a real reason for you to change the package pose. Um, you may just lose it and then you have to figure out again um, how you get the robot back into the same position. Then we talked earlier at the beginning of the application about the tools. So here we have what is called the tool uh, calibration, which has three main sections, the tools itself, then the kinematics and then the dynamics. So tools, basically, you can have different kinematics, which is a tool center point, and you can have different dynamics. And then we just use a tool where you assign two of them. So we see here, by default, we have a tool named flange center which has the kinematic flange center assigned and the dynamics flange center assigned. Then we have another tool, um, for example, the VG10, which has its own kinematics and its own dynamic parameter. Here in the bottom section, when we select a tool, we can change which uh, kin kinematics it's using and we can change which dynamics it's using. Um, for making it easier, you will see here in the area below what the actual configuration is. So for this one, for the VG10, for example, which is a vacuum gripper um, with 10 kilo payload, uh, you see that there is a Z position set for the tool center point, so which is basically the, the pickup position at the, at the suction cups, um, which is at the moment only adjusted in the Z direction with 118.6 um, millimeter. 
there is no rotation or anything defined for this tool. This is also if we are using the jogging uh, mode from the from the robot teaching. If this tool is active, this is where the point the system rotates around or or which it moves. Then on the dynamics, we have most essentially the, the payload. So how heavy is the, the gripper itself? And where is the center of gravity? Um, in some cases, actually not in some cases, most of the cases you have at least uh, two dynamics um, for the same gripper. One's when it hasn't picked anything and another one with a different payload and a different center of gravity um, when it actually has picked something. Um, to set these up correctly is very important because the safety system in the background requires these information. Um, so the collision class can, can do the job as intended. So you should really spend some time with setting up the right tools. If you got a robot from our side, there is the chance that we may have pre-configured some of the tools already beside the flange center or that we provide a tool where you can easily get this um, uh, configured automatically so you don't have to do everything step by step. If it's a standard gripper, we provide as well. Here under the kinematic section, we just talked about it. Here's the, the tool, um, the, yeah, the tool center. Um, the flange center is in a definition with the X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, I'm not a big fan of the color of the arrows being differently than we use them in the robot teaching um, part. Um, where they use the standard colors, here we use separate colors. However, your biggest indicator here is the tool connector hole we see in this picture. That's the one where you can see on the real robot where your coordinate system actually is right now. Uh, here you can uh, add a new kinematics. Um, you can you have here the result. You can also do a kinematics calculation uh, calibration. Um, it basically allows you if you have a tool mounted which is very hard to find the tool center point for because it has some funny shape or you don't know the dimensions. You can use a calibration method with multiple points so that the robot calculates the actual tool center point. Uh, we will make a separate video for that. For most of the standard grippers, you will have the numbers available or you can easily measure them on the robot because most of the grippers we have seen um, only change in the Z direction. So we have more distance in, in the direction of the red arrow we see here on the side picture. Some other grippers, like a VGP20, for example, then has an offset to the, to the center axis of the tool, then you have to compensate for that as well. So this is only the, the handling point, the rotation point, the one we're going to jog around. The one where the payload is in center of gravity is defined under dynamics. Here we see at the moment the flange center is generally defined by zero, and then we have two grippers in here with the payload and with the center of gravity. Um, if here for the VG10 and VGP20, for example, this is an on-robot product where we provide this information in the web interface of the compute box. Um, in other cases, you may um, get it from the manufacturer, or if you have a 3D model, you may have to calculate it by yourself, or you have to estimate it the best you can if necessary. Here, normally, you would have multiple um, dynamics uh, like a VG10 empty and the VG10 picked something and use them in the program as well to dynamically adjust the payload. Then we have the uh, coordinate um, uh, calibration. You can set up your own planes or your own Cartesian system. For example, if you have material which is on, on a surface which is under an angle. So uh, normally what you do is when you, when you want to send a material before you pick it up, you have them on the surface which is inclined and but it automatically compensates in three directions before you pick it up. So right now it would be under an angle compared to your base Cartesian system, like which is normally like a table surface if you mounted the robot in the, in the standard way. You could now make a custom um, plane for your system and it would allow you to jog within that plane so you wouldn't have to follow the um, base coordinate system for example. Um, this one will take a little bit of time to teach, so we also run it in a different video. The last one here then is the safety. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier when we looked at the interface that the collision class 6 is uh, right now configured. Then we have, so again, uh, I mentioned earlier from, from 1 to 10 is the one you, you have. Um, 6 is the default setting, 10 is the most sensitive one, uh, 1 is the least sensitive one. Here we have a move limit. So the first time you start your program, um, this slider is going to decide 
is exactly the same as here, the one on the bottom. So the first time you start the program, where should it be, a 10% or 100%? Standard setting is 100%. So I'll go back to that. I just changed it earlier um, for some testing. So I can put this back to 10, uh, to 100, change it, um, enter the password, and it's, it's saved. Then we have here, enable force control in non-stop state. So um, what does it mean? Uh, the robot has a button on the teach pendant. So if a robot is stopped and the program is not running, you can press this button and you can move the robot arm around by hand. Um, the robot is not, in that case scenario, not um, uh, collecting, recording the track. This is a different function in the robot software you have to use for that. But it allows you to basically release all the motors and then drive a, the robot arm around. By default, this is only possible when the robot is stopped, which means it is in... The program is not running, essentially. However, in some cases, it may be necessary that um, when you hit, uh, when, when you have a safe, safety door or a safeguard around the robot and someone opens that one, if that loop uh, is triggered and you have connected it to the robot, the robot actually goes into a pause mode and not in a stop mode. In that moment, you cannot move the robot around by hand unless you enable the force control in a non-stop state. Okay, under that we have a reset safeguard. So safeguard, again, for people who are not familiar with that, if you have your robot in a separate housing, like a cage, or you have a fence, or you have a door which limits the robot access, you normally have a, a safety switch there, that at the moment where someone opens the door, or if you have a light curtain, or if you have an area sensor, then this one is triggered, and the robot is gonna go in a pause mode and stop where, where it is. Um, now, if you are closing the door or you're moving out of the area, again, the robot will, in a manual reset, not automatically start um, or keep on going or continue where it stopped. It will stay in this moment until someone set a manual reset, which is an external button or an external signal from the POC. Um, if you want that, if someone, for example, if you use an area sensor, when someone walks in, you want the robot to pause and stop. Um, if someone walks out, you automatically want it to restart again, you would set this one to auto reset. Then we have another one, it's an operational mode, a normal mode, verification mode. Um, it's very common with, with bigger industrial robots where you are not able to simulate easily um, what the robot is going to do when it's running, that you run in a verification mode where you had a dead man switch in your, in your hand um, or a free position switch and then the robot only can move if this button is pressed in the right position. If that button is not pressed, the robot automatically will stop, doesn't matter what else is going on there. Um, in a normal situation, you would barely use the, the verification mode um, unless you do some, some high-speed tests of a robot or you have some super sensitive movements with a high risk for damaging a product. This is where you would theoretically use a verification mode. I personally haven't used it yet. Okay, other safety settings here, we have a reduced mode. Um, so there is an input on the robot where you can connect something like a light curtain or an area sensor. And if this sense signal is triggered, then instead of the robot pausing or stopping, it will change to a reduced mode, which is slower and more controlled. So uh, if you have a human interacting with a robot, um, it will have in certain situations where a human comes closer or whatever, can go into a reduced mode where it just keeps going, executing the program, but it's going to use it slower. So here you can either individually configure the uh, joint speeds if you are in a move joint system, or you can configure also the TCP speed for the maximum it can do while it is in reduced mode. Then on top of that, we have a joint limit. Um, joint limits are usually used when uh, you want to make sure that a certain joint can never move into a position. For example, if you have a base joint, which is the, the one here on the bottom, and you know you only want to work in front of a robot and you never ever want to go in a certain space behind the robot, then you could uh, limit the, uh, the joints by instead of having their, their maximum range to reduced range. Yeah. It is part of a risk assessment you should do when you do a robot implementation where you can um, reduce risk class or, or risk evaluations by limiting the joint positions. Last thing we have here is when the system tab, 
Um, we have one the language, so the foreign version uh, by default comes with the British language. Then you can change the date and the time. Um, this one is also the system time. Then you can do network configuration, so by default you're going to have one uh, Ethernet adapter um, in there, which you can configure to communicate with other devices, with servers, with uh, PLCs, anything like that. We have videos where we show how to do these topics, so I'm not going to go deeper in here. Then we have a password for the current user. So if you want to change the admin password, which is recommended, um, once um, the robot is going into real production, you don't want anybody changing your, your program without permission, um, you should change your password from the standard password one to whatever you want to set there. This also works for the operator, but you would have to log in as an operator to change the password. Then we have the system tab. This is a display line numbers, which is um, just for the, the system info screen, if I remember right. Um, and then we have a lock screen time. So the screen will automatically lock after 500 seconds, which is the shipment um, setup. Um, it essentially what it does is if your program is running and um, the teach pendant is idle for that time, it will bring up a lock screen and you have to log in again to make any changes on the, on the robot or, or stop or pause the program. So it's useful if you work in a production line, you make changes and it, it shall lock itself right away. Um, for us, since we are working on these stations for a while and have some idle times in between, we just increase it higher to 3,600. So we don't always have to log in into the screen. Then you have an update area. So here you can do a factory reset on the robot. Um, I recommend you not to play around in this section unless you, you have seen a video or, or you know what you're doing. The factory reset is deleting all your programs, anything you programmed there. And you can also do software updates and firmware updates. However, you have to check when for the right versions. Um, but you can also export here the files. This is the only one most of the people use is you plug in a USB, you can scan for the device, and then you can export log files and program files to the USB. So that's the only um, thing which is usually used um, um, by the end customer. Then we have the extension tab on top. The extension tab has two sections, peripheral and technology on the bottom. Here, this is a highly dynamic system where independent modules can be can be placed into the system or taken out of the system. So um, by standard delivery, the older versions only may have had the camera and the Modbus section. Um, the newer versions have a couple more. There will be a lot of development coming up and it's fairly easy to add modules and take out modules um, from these sections um, if they are configured by um, Overwrite. Uh, here we can see a couple of modules we are using, like we are using Modbus TCP to communicate with a box. And PLC is essentially Ethernet IP, for example, communicating with uh, Mitsubishi PLCs. Then we have a robotic gripper, um, which we are uh, controlling here. And then there are some other modules of Camera Smart 3D, which we honestly haven't used yet, um, which are developed by other companies for, for their tools and Obo just put them in. And then we have here on the bottom the technology. Here we see there is some stacking and some uh, welding plugins. Um, these ones most likely will change a lot with different versions, so uh, you might not see them right now. And if there are specific modules, we're going to make some, some video tutorials about it, how, how you can add them, how you can take them out, and how to use them. Then we have the tab system info left. System info is for you, an indicator here on the bottom is the, is the lock. Um, where you can see the system messages and you would also see like error messages. And on top we have the power status of the current robot with temperature, humidity and the actual joint states with um, the temperatures and so on they have. Because I'm in the simulation mode right now, you don't see anything here. Um, if I'm going out of the simulation mode, you can actually see the real uh, voltage and currents of a robot, including the joint temperatures. Okay. Last tab we had here was the About tab. It's the first one you should have checked at the beginning of a video to see if you have the right uh, teach pendant version here. The second thing is the first time you open the robot, unless you check the box for not seeing it anymore, you're going to get the disclaimer from OVO. Um, if you check the box, you don't want to see it anymore and later want to check it, you will find it here under About and Disclaimer. Okay. 
Um, that's it for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, as mentioned earlier, there will be more videos coming out from our side with um, tutorials, how to, and probably also some downloadable projects um, you can try then so you don't have to set up everything manually by yourself. Thanks and bye bye.